Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson is titled Sharing God's Mission. It's ready for teaching on October 28, and I'm Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 21. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as we seek to find from your word inspiration and guidance for our lives, but also we come to worship you as we open your word. We pray that today your Holy Spirit will be here with us, that we may see where the openings are for us to share your love with others, but also so that we ourselves can be fed. We pray today particularly for Sandra Seely and her family in the Caribbean and Walter from Ellenwood in Georgia, Gary who grows dragon fruits just like I do and other veggies, and Lois Henry and Samsung Blue and Claire Lewis, and Vanessa Quenda and Jerry Hill from Australia, he lives in Adelaide, and Carlson and Carol Ntabo, who live in Kisi in Kenya. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that today your word will speak to us and show us what you would like for us not only to do, but to share with those about us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text this week comes from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let's read that again. John 13, beginning at verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. From the start, Abraham wanted to be used by God for mission. This truth can be seen, for example, in Genesis 18, when God warned him about what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets, we read in Amos 3.7. And in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, his servant, the prophet, was Abraham. Abraham was resting during the heat of the day when he saw three travellers. Ellen White comments in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 138 and 139. Abraham had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. End of quote. Abraham, however, soon became personally involved in God's mission. His involvement, as revealed in this chapter, was to pray for and intercede for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, he wanted to see if somehow these people, despite themselves, could be saved. In a sense, if that is not what mission is about, what is? Throughout this chapter, three great spiritual qualities of Abraham are revealed— hospitality, love and prayer, qualities that can greatly aid in mission as well. Sunday, October 22, The Gift of Hospitality Read Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 to 15. What elements of hospitality are demonstrated in Abraham's response to his guests? Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh your hearts. After that you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make 
ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. This behaviour was unusual. At that time of the day in summer, when the sun is at its zenith, everyone is looking for shade and for a fresh breeze. But perhaps Abraham was enduring the heat in order to help anyone who might be passing by. While there, he saw three travellers. His practice, most likely, was to offer hospitality to strangers. This is why the initiative of the encounter was from Abraham. In the text, he ran toward them from the entrance of his tent. That is, and this point is important, Abraham took the initiative to meet them even before they came to him. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. We read in verses 4 and 5. Abraham was aware of his mission, which was to share with everyone the knowledge of the Lord in a world engulfed in paganism, idolatry and polytheism. As we can see in this incident, his most immediate way to fulfil his mission was through the hospitality toward these strangers, who seemed to have just appeared on the horizon. Meanwhile, Abraham's, as Ellen White writes in Education, page 187, great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few but newly converted from heathenism. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained. And many a roving Canaanite, whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham his servant, tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. End of quote. From the start, this man understood that God had called him to mission and that his going to the promised land was not for a vacation, but to be a blessing to those around him and through his seed to the world. And so to finish today, what principles of Abraham's example of hospitality can you emulate in your own life? Monday, October 23, Abraham's love for everyone. Read Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. How did Abraham exercise his great quality of love for all people without distinguishing tribe, race, or people? Genesis 18, beginning at verse 16. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, 
Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the places for their sake. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. The second quality of Abraham, drawn from Genesis 18, was his love for people, even for those he did not personally know. This is a great lesson for each of us. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were sinners, far removed from his values, but his heart was full of love for everyone without any distinction of race, gender, language or religion. God Then reveals to Abraham his decision to annihilate the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 20 and 21 we read, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. With great humility and reverence, Abraham addressed his request to God. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? In verse 25. Through his love, Abraham hoped to save all the people in these cities, not only the righteous. Certainly, Abraham knew just how evil and wicked the people were who lived there. Who knows what stories he had heard regarding those people and their practices? And from what we know about them, as revealed in the next chapter with the sordid story of Lot and the mob outside his house, these were very evil people. Let's read that part of the story in Genesis 19, verses 1 to 11. Now, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When he saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. 
And they said, No, we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men that came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See, now I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please, let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot, and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands, and pulled Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Yet Abraham, knowing for himself the love of God, appealed to him in their behalf. Abraham knew that human beings always can return to God in repentance. To Abraham, saving the inhabitants of these cities would give them a chance to repent. In the end, Abraham based his request on what he personally knew about God's love for human beings. He himself had a great love for sinners, and he knew that as long as there is life, there is hope for salvation. And so to finish the day, why is intercessory prayer so important in our own prayer life? How can praying for others in need help us grow spiritually and experience more the reality of God's love for sinners? Tuesday, October 24, Abraham's Spirit of Prayer Read Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 to 32, and James 5, 16. What should this teach us about the power of intercessory prayer? Genesis 18, beginning at verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the fifty righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of forty. And he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. And then James chapter 5 verse 6. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The dialogue between Abraham and God is a type, a representation of intercessory prayer. 
Abraham is presented in this chapter as an intercessor before God for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was pleading for them in behalf of them. That is, he was in a way acting as a type, a symbol of Jesus as our intercessor before the Father. Our mission today will be successful only if we proceed with these kinds of prayer. Abraham had learned to love the inhabitants of Sodom, Gomorrah and the other cities close by. This is why his prayer was honest and sincere. He already had fought against some kings who had defeated the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. After Abraham's victory, Berah, the king of Sodom, came to meet Abraham with Melchizedek. Berah asked to have his people return to their homes. Genesis 14.21 reads, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. This is an indication of the love of this king for his people. Since one of the great characteristics of Abraham was love, he loved the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he prayed for them and their people. Love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 140. Abraham exercised humility and perseverance in his prayers. As soon as God accepted the first request to save the city as long as 50 righteous people were living there, he continued his intercession. Our mission cannot be successful without prayer, intercessory prayer. After meeting someone, after giving a sermon or a Bible study, we must pray for the people we have been in contact with. God is heedful of these prayers in touching the hearts of the people we have contacted. It is not our words or eloquence that will convert our friends or acquaintances. It is the Holy Spirit. This is why, in any mission in which we are engaged, we must pray for each person individually. So to finish today, read Romans 8, 34 and Hebrews 7, 25. What do they tell us about what Jesus does for us? And how might this truth help us understand better our own role as intercessors for others? First of all, Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wednesday, October 25, Abraham's Mission. Read Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 29. What was the result of Abraham's spirit of hospitality, love, and prayer? Genesis 19, beginning at verse 1. Now, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. 
So they pressed hard against the man lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else there, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please, no, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favour in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown to me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favoured you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, Z-O-A-R. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt." The text gives an interesting indication about the position of Lot in the city of Sodom. Verse 1 of chapter 19 read, Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. This means he was an important character in the city, certainly a public officer, because sitting in the gate is a privilege of officers, judges and kings. As you read in 2 Samuel 19 and verse 8, Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told all the people, saying, This is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for everyone of Israel had fled to his tent. In Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 7, which reads, Now Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin. And then Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, my friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Genesis 19 almost parallels chapter 18 and the story of the angels with Abraham. Abraham and Lot were each sitting at an entrance or gate 
We read in chapter 18, verse 1, and chapter 19, verse 1, Abraham and Lot each invited strangers to rest in their abode, as we read in yesterday in Genesis 18, verse 3 and 4, and today in Genesis 19, verse 2. Abraham and Lot each prepared food for their visitors, as we read yesterday in verses 4 and 8, and today in verse 3. Whatever else is false, Lot had some good characteristics, it seems. Then, it says in chapter 19 of Genesis, verses 24 and 25, The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. We don't know how many people were living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah at the time of this account, but among these thousands of people, only four left the city, and only three were saved. The same with the Genesis flood. We don't know how many were alive then, but we know that most were not saved. The small number of residents of Sodom who were saved has implications for our own mission. Not everyone will be saved. We would like everyone to accept Jesus and his plan of salvation, but each person has a free will. Our task is to invite as many people as possible to make the choice for Jesus. While we are carrying out our mission, God assists us through the Holy Spirit, but he will never go against the will of anyone. Free will means that, in the end, no matter what we do, no matter how much we pray, salvation comes down to each individual's choice. And so to finish today, how can we learn not to be discouraged if we are not seeing the kind of results that we want when we do mission? Thursday, October 26, Submission to God's Will Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. What do these verses teach about submitting to God's will, even when the path ahead does not seem clear? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were there in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Then he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. One of the main qualities of Abraham was his submission to God's will. All the experiences of Abraham with God were characterized by this submission. His calling? Abraham received a challenging call from heaven. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you, in Genesis 12 verse 1. When he heard a voice from heaven, his first reaction could have been to disregard this voice, thinking he was having a hallucination. Or he could have challenged the message, saying something such as, I don't want to go, I like it here. The land I will show you may have seemed a strange description of a destination, but he accepted the call. He submitted his will to the will of God and left his father's household and his country. And verse 4 reads, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Choice of the land. 
A quarrel erupted between the servants of Lot and those of Abraham. But Abraham was not a man to fight with his own flesh and blood. He submitted to God's will, who again blessed him. The Lord said to Abram, we read in Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15, after Lot had separated from him, Now raise your eyes and look from the place from where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah When God revealed to Abraham the destiny of these two cities, Abram, full of love, tried to save the cities. Because there were not even ten righteous persons in the cities, the cities were destroyed. Abraham submitted to the will of God and accepted God's judgment of those cities. The Lord was able to use Abraham because of his submission to God in all circumstances. It must be the same with us today. And here's challenge to finish today's study. In our cities, we face obstacles in preaching the gospel appropriately and effectively. We need to plead with God to intervene. And challenge up. Find a way to contact someone who is being directly affected by a difficult situation similar to your own. Tell that person you were praying for him or her and ask God to show you what you can do to help. Friday, October 27. Love for the perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 140. While he loathed the sins of that corrupt city, he desired that the sinners might be saved. His deep interest for Sodom shows the anxiety that we should feel for the impenitent. We should cherish hatred of sin, but pity and love for the sinner. All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible, as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid the sinner flee from this fateful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who, with humility and persevering faith, are pleading with God for him? The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The Son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He who has paid the price for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul. With an antagonism to evil, such as can exist only in a nature spotlessly pure, Christ manifested toward the sinner a love which infinite goodness alone could conceive. In the agonies of the crucifixion, himself burdened with the awful weight of the sins of the whole world, he prayed for his revilers and murderers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, verse 34, end of quote. And then from the same book, page 133 and 134, Abraham was honoured by the surrounding nations as a mighty prince and a wise and able chief. He did not shut away his influence from his neighbours. His life and character, in their marked contrast with those of the worshippers of idols, exerted a telling influence in favour of the true faith. His allegiance to God was unswerving, while his affability and benevolence inspired confidence and friendship, and his unaffected greatness commanded respect and honour. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions this week. One, what other examples from Scripture show us an individual who fulfilled his call to mission? What about John the Baptist? Would you call him successful? Two, read Genesis 19, verses 30 to 36. What does this tell us about the character of some of those saved from Sodom? Genesis 19, beginning at verse 30. Then Lot went up out of Zoar 
and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come in to us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. And question three. What about lessons we can learn from the example of Abraham regarding mission and how it is done? And four. Think about this. Would you deem Abraham's intercession for Sodom and Gomorrah successful or a failure? The Little Church That Could by Andrew McChesney It seemed the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Rügen Island in Germany would have to close. Only six people worshipped there, four elderly members of a single family, and two other older people. Membership had dwindled from seven when the church was founded in 1940 and from its heyday of 33 members in the late 1950s. Conference leaders recommended selling the site. No, we want to keep the church, Gunhardt, the church's head elder, told them. We don't want to sell it. Membership fell after Germany's 1990 reunification. Elderly members died, younger ones moved away, and the population of the former East German island grew very secular. Attendance only swelled when vacationers flocked to the island in the summer. Some vacationers were Adventist. Gunhard and his wife and parents joined the other two church members in praying for the church's future. Bring us new members, they prayed. Then an Adventist physician and his family moved to the island. Church members kept praying. A former member suddenly renewed his membership and several other people joined. When membership hit 16, conference leaders changed their minds. They agreed to keep the church open. But by then the church needed a new building. Members prayed and agreed to contribute 136,000 euros, which is 136,000 US. While the sum fell far short of the final 730,000 euro bill, it encouraged them to keep praying. Gunhardt, who had built several houses, designed a church building that also would serve as a centre of influence. Church members from across Germany gave generously. The most unexpected contribution came after Gunhardt met a government leader at a business meeting. German politicians have authority to distribute state funds to private causes. The leader, hearing about the initiative, put Gunhard in touch with a local politician. Church members prayed before Gunhard met with the politician and were delighted when the politician offered 300,000 euro. But he had a catch. As a Christian, he said, I want the new church building to be used not only for social purposes, but also to spread the word of God. Today, 25 members and their children gather every Sabbath. We have a new church building and no debt, Gunhard said. God confirmed that our church should stay open. The Rugen Church is waiting for more miracles. Located in one of the most secular places on earth, the church has a mission illustrating mission objective number two from the Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. To strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups. I Will Go 2020.org The people here are not very religious, Gunhard says. We are trying to connect with them. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. 
Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful. Thank you.